So and now it's time uh, to start the event with our, our amazing first keynote, uh, uh, Mark Boyd. Uh, so Mark is, has been uh, an analyst and an expert of this industry. He has been a journalist for many years. And uh, he will uh, present us uh, his conclusion about the API uh, uh, industry, especially in open banking. He has been the co-author of a report on, uh, on open banking since 2015. Uh, so every year he publish the state of the art of the of, the, of, of of open banking, and we will be glad to have her have him uh, there. So I, I will invite uh, Mark uh, on on stage. Uh, so if we can send, it's like a real stage, right? We uh, people kind of walk on the stage, but everything happens backstage. Uh, there, hello, Mark. How are you? Hey there, Mehdi. Me here. Yeah, good. So the main challenge, like in in live events, is to share your screen with attendees. Uh, so uh, uh, you know where is the button. You know how to click. Yeah. We'll pray to God of presentations to uh, to make the screen sharing works. Yeah. Are you able to share a screen? Here we go. You get to see all the tabs I have open. Yeah. 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 How to how to use the memory, the RAM of all the computer. <laughs> so yeah. Mark, you have a uh, uh, yeah, forty-five minutes for. Uh, I know it's not enough for all the work you've done in this industry, but but yeah, I think you've you've summed up in a way uh, that that's great. So uh, I'll ask everybody at home to think about Mark. Applaud, have a warm full applause for him in your mind. And yes, the stage is for you, Mike. Mark. Thanks, Mehdi. So live from New York, it's API days. Hey everyone, I'm Mark Boyd. I'm founder and writer analyst of at Platformable. I use the pronouns he, him, and his. Uh, so today, oh, here's a little bit about me, first of all. Um, so my, uh, my recent work is included co-authoring a framework for digital government APIs for the European Commission. I do some work on open APIs for final financial inclusion with the World Bank and I'm the co-author, as Mehdi said, um, of Axway's State of the Market Open Banking Reports. So today I'll be talking about open banking in an age of transformation. And as you can see, I'm clearly going to uh, be announcing a football game straight after this event. So I've got my, um, uh, my mic and my headphones ready. So in this presentation, I want to ask, at this critical juncture in the global society, can open banking help reinvent global society and economies by leveraging a platform approach? First, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Fuwan Pham and Arjit Mathur, uh, who helped me collate and analyze much of the data that I'll be presenting today. So for the past several years, each of us have probably rolled our eyes when we have seen or heard someone say digital transformation or have seen some of these uh, uh, stock photos, especially that one of the guy pressing on the glass. Uh, it's become an overused term to describe the need for businesses across all sectors, including this API Day's theme of legacy industries like banking and healthcare, to modernize their infrastructure and operations and to allow engagement at any time on any device guided by the user's needs, not what the service provider wants to offer. But now as COVID-19 ravages the globe and with similar crises yet to develop when climate change impacts uh, hit us next, we live not in a moment of digital transformation, but I think in what we are just beginning to realize will be an age of transformation. In truth, this has already been occurring, but COVID-19 has sort of sped this up. Yes, businesses and industries have needed to reorient themselves to a digital era. And yes, COVID-19 has propelled that forward. But wider than that, business models are changing as our economies move more towards platform-based models in which we can all participate in the ecosystem. It's not a model of producer selling to consumer anymore, but one in which producers work with other producers and even consumers themselves to create and extend value. In banking, we are seeing the start that the start of the age of transformation is beginning with global resets of the workforce. In the past, if you were advocating for the introduction of API technologies into banks, you would often get to a certain point internally where it looked like you had the full support of the C-suite and, uh, and sponsorship for your mission, only to have that whisked out from under you when it became apparent that we were talking about a platform mindset shift with, uh, with, that would require a bank to see itself fundamentally differently as an API-enabled API digital business. 
No one wanted to make the decisions on retraining or retre retrenching traditional bank teller workforces or to do the hard work of rebuilding traditional product chains for a digital era. So I once consulted with um, uh, a partner who was working with a bank and we put forward a whole series of ideas around how to create API value chains for their car leasing business line. Using design uh, thinking techniques, we imagine new product strategies where the bank would identify high user segments and then use APIs to create products uh, that helped, for example, enterprise customers move their whole uh, fleet en masse to electric vehicles. The bank looked at the work that they would need to do to first uh, clean up their historical customer data and create new streamlined lease scoring systems. Systems that currently had hundreds of data points in a complicated assessment system. And, ta and the task of having to clean up and modernize and simplify that scoring system just outweighed the team's desire to move to an API infrastructure. So it was all shelved. I've heard of other stories of banks um, having looking at moving towards digital infrastructure and like these, uh, some of these headlines show, were thinking, you know, knew that the result would be that they'd have to retrench staff. And then even though it got all the go ahead, it still ended up um, uh, uh, folding at the last minute. But now speaking with banks around the globe, especially since we, uh, since we prepare data for each of our quarterly banking trends reports, I've seen how this is a perfect example of how banks are tentatively approaching APIs and then backing off. So that's even despite C-level sponsorship. Of course, there are some examples of leadership where this isn't in the, the case, but in the banking industry to date, those sorts of leaders have been the outliers, and we'll discuss that a bit more as we go forward. But now, of course, now as these headlines demonstrate, all taken from the last couple of months, um, banks are dusting off those workforce retrenchment plans with the impacts of COVID becoming apparent. Personally, I think it would cost less for them to retrain staff in those banking areas that have been wound down and invest in workforce development. So banking and tele staff move into user experience and even coding roles, and they could move traditional product line staff into digital teams. But I also, having worked with banks, see why that's not possible. People in traditional banking roles and those in established lines of business can be resistant to, uh, to um, change. And to date, many have argued against the move towards digital infrastructure point blank and haven't necessarily negotiated on the, billing, uh, on the basis of willingness to re retrain. So now I believe we're in a situation where banks are going to have to retrench a whole ton of jobs and then hire a new workforce with a different set of skills. While I personally support the idea of collective bargaining and fighting for workers' rights, I'm also personally annoyed um, with a lot of the union negotiations in legacy industries that end up fighting for worker retainment in current roles rather than lobbying for retraining capacity. You see that in uh, you see that pushback in banking, healthcare, utilities, energy, all the legacy industries. I know it's beyond the remit of API days, but I'd love to see an API conference include talks on how that employment shift in large legacy industries could happen. And here's why, because I believe that the most defining feature of APIs is that they are the tail wagging the dog. APIs fu fundamentally alter how we do things. Let's rewind to what I was just saying about banks. So banks couldn't get digital transformation efforts fully off the ground because fundamentally it would mean shifting resources away from traditional banking arrangements like bank teleservices and reinvesting that into digital channels. So that means retrenching thousands of staff in each bank and reinvesting that money into new staff and technical in architecture to make digital transformation possible. So there is that huge ec macroeconomic impact driven by APIs. But there's also another major impact, which Mehdi Majawi and I have been writing about since we started the State of the Market Open Banking Reports five years ago, as Mehdi said. And that's the need for banks to move to a platform mindset. This was in one of our first reports where we talked about um, banks having to uh, think about being either adapt adaptation, which means meeting regulatory requirements, or adoption, where they see the whole opportunity of um, platforms. Um, so that's a huge shift for banks, though, to, for, for them to see themselves as partnering with a whole range of ecosystem suppliers and also treating their customers more openly so that if you as a bank cannot give customers the services they need, you actually want one of your partners to give them that service. Let's come back to all of this in a minute. First, I want to ask, what is API? 
Okay, as you can see here from a popular Twitter thread, API means either angry pandas inbound, or I like this haiku here on the right, a stupid program. I don't want to make requests to manually um, add. Please add a library that does the work for me. Okay, so now we know what API means. And we all know how APIs operate. But why API? APIs are connectors that link systems together. Okay, and they do it with a contract in place about who can link to what, with what privileges, et cetera. But why do we want to build that type of IT architecture? APIs make components reusable. So a bank can create a secure login function and use that in their online website, an Android app, and an iPhone app. But why make it reusable? It means you can build products faster. That website app, um, Android, iPhone app, you've re reduced the time it took to build each of those so you can ship them to market faster. And there's less chance that one app will have an, it will introduce errors because you're just reusing the code into all of them. Also, if you have to upgrade the security on one of the apps, you can do it with all three at once. But if you only have those three products, then they're built, once they're built, you, why would you be bothered um, having re -compo uh, reusable components? With APIs, you can allow others to build apps for your customers. Maybe there are still some BlackBerry customers out there somewhere and you don't want to build for them, but you can release the secure login API and now one of your partners can help you keep those customers by building for them. Maybe your iPhone app looks pretty old school and you want to reach TikTok users, but you don't understand them. So you work with a third party who builds an app that Gen Z want to use. But why use APIs to build all of these products? Because it allows participants to co-create co the value they want. Third parties get to build viable businesses by creating new products and services that they can sell with your APIs as the raw ingredients. Customers get to access your banking services by using the apps and services that best reflect their needs. But why give consumers and third party uh, partners so much choice? And now we get to the fifth why, to make money. At the core of it, banks are for-profit businesses who have to return dividends to shareholders and offering a wide array of personalized digital products and services is essential to maintaining and growing a customer base. Of course, for other types of industries, there are other fifth whys. For healthcare, it might be about, uh, it might be about um, helping uh, providers being able to help support their users to stay healthy and enhance their well-being. For governments, it might be to enable citizen engagement and trust. Even for banks, technically, it should be more like to support our customers to grow their wealth and financial well-being. But even an idealist like me knows that at the end of the day, their mission is to make money. So let's look at these last two whys through the lens of open banking. If our whys are to allow participants uh, to co-create value and to make money, then open banking APIs should be able to do both of those things for all ecosystem participants. At Platformable, we, Formable, we call this the five wins model. So open banking should create wins for five key stakeholders. And these are on the, um, uh, the diamond uh, tiles on the right-hand side. Banks should win because they can create new business models and reinvent themselves for the digital era. Fintech should win because they can enter a market they were previously locked out of and can build viable businesses. Consumers should win because they have access to a wider choice of financial products and, in and can increase their wealth and savings. The underserved should win because they should be able to access financial services and build their financial history, which have previously prevented them from using bank services to their full extent. In emerging markets, underserved means not being able to even open a bank account. Uh, but in more developed countries, the underserved often refers to small businesses, women, migrants, and the self-employed who have less access to credit than white male mainstream society. And one final stakeholder, the API industry itself should win because banks are large enterprise customers. So their use of API technologies will help mature the industry for everyone. Our research found that you also need four enablers to help uh, the open banking ecosystem deliver those wins. And these are along the bottom here. We generally, but not always, need a regulatory environment that encourages open banking. We need high levels of developer experience uh, so that um, uh, so FinTech can build products using the, the bank APIs. We need standards to speed up development by helping everyone communicate effectively. And we need high level security so that data and financial systems are safe. 
Open banking, while still a fairly new phenomenon, has been in place long enough that we can now start testing whether open banking systems actually are creating benefits for everyone in the ecosystem. Our premise is that platforms are best when they are a tide that rises all boats. To put it another way, as you know, in 2020, everything is cake. So platforms should be big cakes where everyone can have a slice. It's also imperative that we start measuring the open banking ecosystem value now at the start of this age of transformation. One thing we should all definitely want from an age of transformation is that it resets a lot of the power and market imbalances that have got us into many of the troubles we face today. That includes the discounting of packaging and resource costs of production, which means we now need to create a new circular economy model. It includes the patriarchal structural racism and inequity that our governments and markets have entrenched. And it means the black bank oligopoly that regulators are trying to open up. Um, needs to be enabled for fintech, mar uh, fintech to enter the market. In all cases, at old, as old systems are torn down and we rebuild, the idea is that our new systems should not be re replicating the power differentials of our old systems. So let's look at the data so far. At Platformable, we specialize in measuring the value of ecosystems, and we we're excited to be looking at new partnerships like with API Deck, who have an awesome open banking tracker. We're looking at ways to collaborate and build out our ecosystem model in future, a bit like how I had the honour to work with John Musser to build out the CGAP API dashboard with the World Bank's consultative group to assist the poor. The CGAP API dashboard now measures how open APIs are being used in emerging markets to build financially inclusive products. And I'll come back to that point when we discuss whether open banking APIs are supporting the underserved. Around the globe, regulation has been a driver to open, uh, to open up banking. Governments around the world have sought to encourage a new suite of financial services and products by forcing banks to open their key functionalities and allowing other entrants into what had previously been a fairly closed a market, the oligopoly that I was referring to. This was partly driven by the fact that fintech were already trying to offer new services, so governments were realising that banks have been performing pretty badly at keeping up with customer demands. There have been other motives for open banking. In Europe, for example, it has been driven by the need for interoperability in a digital single market. In Australia, it's driven by consumer, uh, it's driven by consumer data rights. In Indonesia, financial inclusion is, is a key goal of open banking regulation. But consumer choice and the need to force banks to open up their stranglehold on the market have been a fairly common factor in most regulatory environments. Along with regulation, standards have then been adopted or enforced in order to create a market environment where fintech can enter quickly and not have to build artisanal handcrafted integrations with each bank. Uh, this has been less successful. Regions like UK and New Zealand have leveraged regulation to introduce standard API templates that all banks must use. And as I'll show in a minute, that has sped up and increased the number of fintech being able to uh, build solutions for those areas. Other regions like Europe haven't got API standard templates, but they've got the Berlin Group, STET, Open Bank Project. Um, just a, a, but generally, they've just got a list of requirements that each bank API must include. So as a result, in Europe, you're seeing a new sector of API aggregators emerging like TrueLayer, LuxHub, Nordic API Gateway, that are all creating middleware layer that can standardize the indiv individual bank APIs for fintech. New Zealand have kind of baked that into their regulatory environment through their API hub. And areas like US and Nigeria that, uh, that don't have regulatory enforcement of open banking are seeing industry-led standards emerge, which are driven uh, more by competition and interest amongst stakeholders to collaborate. So I know Dinesh Katyal from uh, Financial Data Exchange is speaking later today, and certainly the work that FTX has done to encourage API standard adoption for banking has really helped create open bank banking successes in the United States. There's also groups like Open Vector in Mexico, led by Mariana Velazquez, um, who are working well with partners to encourage understanding of standards and how they can be leveraged to speed up innovation and open banking solutions. So with regulations and standards acting as enablers, you can see that banking platforms around the globe are growing at a fast clip. 
we have a slight lag in how uh, we how quickly we notice and add new banking platforms to our database. But between Q1 and Q2 2020, we saw 49% growth in banks launching open banking platforms. A lot of that was in Europe, where open banking regulations came into force in 2020 uh, in 2019. Uh, and there's other more mature regulatory environments like Singapore, Hong Kong, and New Zealand. But around the globe, we now have 293 open banking platforms, and together they've released 2,029 API products. You can see by far the most, uh, the majority are releasing accounts and payments APIs, um, which are the most commonly required by the regulation. But there was also signs uh, of banks seeking to innovate and build new partnerships with FinTech by exposing other functionalities, like you can see here, bank products and ATM locations, mm, that's mostly um, Australia and UK where it's a requirement under the regulations, but you can see then identity, KYC, um, credit scoring and pre-loan approvals, and then there's a, a bit less for some of the other newer types of API products. So are banks winning? I'd say that those that are embracing a platform mindset are seeing gains. There are three indicators that I like to use for banks to measure whether they are benefiting from open bank APIs. New account crea creation, transaction volume, and network effects. So my favorite story here is Pamada Bank in Indonesia. Pamada is able to demonstrate high levels of success with new account creation and transaction volume. These are the, so it's 68% new account annual growth rate coming through via their, via FinTech that are using their APIs and the transaction volume growth rate from payment processes occurring on through their APIs is 23%. And for network effects, by the way, you can see Postman's banking API collections. They list Challenger Bank Bunk, for example, which has over 1,000 likes by developers. So those developers are sharing and promoting the bank's APIs, which drives more Postman users to look into it and add those banks uh, to their own collection. There's other banks like um, here, I've got ABN AMRO who've just had their website and developer portal updated, but with the help of Pronovix, which looks uh, amazing. Um, and they're able to promote their APIs by showing the business value. So here in the middle, you can see they talk about how um, payments requests are 50% faster and 80% are paid within 24 hours because of using the API. And then they've got a pricing page. So they've already been able to move to a business model, a monetized business model for this particular API. So there are signs that banks are moving, you know, are being able to redevelop their business models, uh, create new revenue opportunities because of partnering with FinTech and making the APIs available. So are FinTech winning? Uh, I'd say it's too early to tell, but the signs are positive. There'll be some, uh, I think there'll be some market consolidation in, in the future, of course. Like for now, everyone can build personal financial management um, apps based off account information APIs, but at some point that industry is going to consolidate, I think. So there's been a flurry of fintech getting accreditation to use open banking APIs in UK and Europe. And here I think is where you can start to see, I'm not sure if my um, cursor comes up for you, but I'm pointing to the top of the UK um, in the table. The, I, think, I think you can see the difference between having open API standards um, and where regulation doesn't enforce standards. So here, UK, there, you know, there's 189 fintech operating in the UK. There's 139 that are uh, of, that originated that are out of the UK. And then you can see for all of the European countries listed under that, the originating doesn't go above 35 and the operating doesn't go above 115. So the fact that UK has an API standard template that all banks must use, I think is driving that, um, uh, that uh, the, the fintech industry much faster to develop and mature there than in Europe. And I know you can say, well, UK is traditionally a financial center. And okay, so that might have an influence, but then you've got to subtract the fact that they're um, uh, post Brexit. So now uh, they're not really going to be able to immediately have European borders. So that would take it away. So, I mean, uh, there are, like we say, there are the macroeconomic factors, you know, like with the, but the APIs here, I think are uh, wagging the dog. Um, actually, what's odd with the European 
regulation as well, is that in Europe, you can passport your fintech, which means you can apply for your accreditation um, in fintech to use bank APIs, and you can apply for it for multiple jurisdictions. So you can ask for it for all European countries at once, for example. But from our talks with fintech, many of them aren't that clear that they can do that. So only 24% of European fintech are accredited to build in more than 20 European countries. And 59% are accredited to only offer their services in one country. Uh, Jacques Putz, the CEO of Luxhub, puts it well when he says that in the fintech world, startups that are keen to focus on the US because they see there's a 330 million uh, population size consumer market. Whereas in Europe, they count an individual country and see that as the size. So like it's 83 million population for Germany or 67 million for France. But if they had accredited fintech and standardized banking APIs, the startups could see Europe's consumer market size as 740 million, the whole of Europe. That thinking hasn't really transferred into the dynamism in the market yet, but it's that kind of thinking that fintechs need. But it's also the platform thinking that banks need in order to encourage fintech partnerships. I'm not seeing that as per pervasive as a thought just yet. For Asia Pacific, we're just starting to me measure this because we because the accreditation systems and fintech registers aren't as advanced as Europe. So we've got to sort of um, uh, tally by hand, if you like. But you can see, see here that open banking APIs are stimulating new market entrants, particularly in Singapore. And fintech here are looking at a whole range of business models. And you can see that the different types that are being trialed at the moment, a lot of subscription revenue, but there are some commission-based and transactional revenue. Transactional revenue or more payments oriented uh, fintech, for example. So I think what's needed next here is the need for banks to have an easier way to identify high value fintech they can partner with. They need to look at fintech that can bring in new customer segments, that have accreditation to operate in a wide set of markets, that have products that don't complete, uh, directly compete with the bank's own offerings, and that have the technology in place to uh, make secure integrations easier. So I think that's definitely what's needed in order for fintech to flourish. From a technical point of view, from a platform mindset point of view, I still think we need to have banks seeing the fintech as potential partners rather than as competitors around user experience. This is also where we need to look at developer experiences and enabler. So banks need to think of their API consumers as viable businesses in their own right. By the way, most of, um, mostly I've been focusing today on um, open APIs. There are a large amount of uh, enterprise users of a bank's APIs that are using the open banking APIs internally for systems like their, uh, their, their enterprise accounting software, where they maybe even use a, a foreign exchange API from a bank and then based on um, optimal timings of trade, they're making, they're moving money across their um, their corporate offices and so forth. Um, and that is actually a much larger piece of the pie. That's like um, probably up to 80% of usage of bank APIs. And then also now with COVID and things, I think we're going to see API teams within banks being co-opted to help the bank with using APIs, uh, internal APIs across all of a business function. But they are subjects for another um, presentation, we're going to focus on open APIs and the impact of, um, of open e ecosystems today. So if banks are going to consider third party API consumers as viable businesses in their own right, then what they want to get to that, and so they want um, the third parties, third parties to get to that fifth why of making money. So to do that, they need to help their business, those businesses build their products as fast as they possibly can and have them released to market, build a customer base, and then that will drive the new revenue back to the bank quickly. So to do that, banks need to invest in developer experience. For this, we looked at three indicators of developer experience. So here you can see whether banks are offering a developer portal, um, which catalogs all the bank's APIs, whether they have use case descriptions for each of the APIs that they offer, and then whether they have clear pricing pages that explain what the cost will be when the third party puts the, puts the APIs into a commercial product production ready app. There are other models of developer experience and other indicators. Dave O'Neill from API Metrics has an awesome uh, model for measuring the uptime and performance of bank APIs, and that's an essential part of developer experience in that third parties need to be assured that the bank APIs that they're using are performant. Uh, 
Carolyn Luco and her team at WIP um, have also have a model of developer engagement that's worth checking out. Um, and I know the team at Orbit um, are working on some developer engagement uh, metrics, mostly around open source technologies at the moment. I'm keen to hear Derek Gilling at most of present later during API's days um, on their de developer engagement metrics model. And uh, this morning, we've also got Sheena Ganesh uh, from Visa and Claire Barrett from API First, who'll be talking about, amongst other things, developer engagement, I'm sure, in their, in their presentations. In the work John Musser and I did with the World Bank CGAP, we identified three levels of engagement that are listed here under Dev Portal Analysis, onboarding, retention, and business support. And we map what developer resources um, are available at each of those levels. So you can see under um, onboarding support, we've got, for example, SDKs. Um, Adil Ali from API Matic, uh, the, the co-founder and um, PhD, uh, in Web APIs, Guy uh, has got a great model that looks at the role of um, SDKs and other developer resources that's worth checking out as well. Okay. So, are consumers winning? Well, yes and no. Consumers def are definitely getting a wider range of products available to them. So we mapped what types of products fintech were building with bank APIs. Remember, this is a subset of all fintech. At this stage, we're interested in whether open banking is making a difference. So it's really only those fintech that are accredited to use bank APIs. Um, so, but when we look just at those ones, um, uh, we, what we see is that there's the um, a high level of products being targeted at the small and medium enterprise and uh, a smaller amount focused on individual households. One thing I worry about is that banks aren't measuring this. I know it's early days, but banks by and large aren't even trying to see if their bank APIs are making a difference in the day-to-day -day lives of their customers. That really worries me and it should worry them as well. Banks need to have a platform mindset in order to survive. APIs are the tail wagging the dog, remember. For banks, allow, APIs allow them to reposition so they can collaborate and can compete with fintech that might have, been, that might have better user experience and more niche-driven personalized product offerings for clients. But, but a platform mindset means that banks also have a larger ecosystem footprint, which will make it harder for the tech giants like Amazon and Facebook to come along and replace them. I'll take more, talk more about that in a minute too. But in order for banks to build that ecosystem and have it robust enough that cus customers are sticky in their ecosystem web, they, they have to actually want customers to be financially solvent. We are seeing this with COVID impacts. Banks are worried about loan defaulters. They're worried about small business customers, kind of. I feel like they're too much worried about this from their point of view and haven't yet cha changed the chip and realized that their customer's success is their success. If they made sure their customers had access to a full range of products that help them with their cash flow, savings, minimizing disruptions to their loans repayments, that the banks would weather the storms, not just against COVID, but like I said earlier, against the, uh, the com coming tech giant apocalypse. And the starting point with this is for banks, for regulators, for all of us to be able to measure whether open banking APIs are actually making a difference in people's lives. So you, here you can see that household and individual consumers aren't seeing the, um, the gains from open banking in Europe and Asia Pacific yet. In both Europe and Asia Pacific, um, where again, remember FinTech have to be accredited to use bank API. So we have better um, data in these regions, but the majority of products that are being built are targeting small and medium enterprises. Only 27% of FinTech products built with bank APIs in Europe focus on household and individuals. So the good news is that SMEs are benefiting from open banking, but mostly for, through access to enterprise collaboration software, which would suggest that they're gaining access to, so, uh, to products that help them save money rather than make money. <clears throat> Okay, but when consumers do get access to products, gains are possible. One of the fintech I'm most excited about is Cake. Yes, it's still 2020, so everything is still Cake. 
But what I love about Cake is that they have a data sharing business model. They use bank account information APIs to offer users a personal financial management app, which also helps identify possible savings opportunities and does some product and market comparison to help their users save some money. They also do sales deals uh, so they can offer their customers discounts for swapping to a different brand, um, which you actually see pop up on a number of personal financial management apps. And I've even seen that as an approach, some of the challenges that bank banks are offering now. But what Cake does is aggregate and anonymize uh, all of their user data and then sell that user data to enterprises who want to get a fuller picture of spending habits. So, um, so when Cake sell that anonymized aggregated data, they revenue share with their app users. Eve Bovan from Cake told me earlier this year that they were on track to be giving almost 10 euros back to each app user for Q2 2020. That's up from five euro uh, back in Q1. That's a 50% profit share between the users and the FinTech. And it's a great demonstration of how users should be in control of their banking data. The biggest challenge for Cake is still the banks have created a lot of obstacles. In June this year, the European Banking Authority wrote a clarification on obstacles that third parties were still facing. Things like convoluted consent and re-consent processes, every 90 day re-authentication and manual entry of customer account details. Despite European leg re regulation, each member state in Europe still has a blank bank block that is lobbying and advocating for how APIs can be implemented for with third parties. And countries like Belgium are showing that there, is, there isn't that platform mindset amongst the banks, which in turn, I think it still indicates that there's a lot of banks who are averse to the idea of, of, of offering their customers a greater range of financial services. So if consumers are hardly winning, are they underserved? Our analysis of emerging markets says no. We found one instance of a bank offering low-income consumers a loan product in Brazil, but that's because the loans are underwritten by the government. They are, they're for workers, so you actually have to be employed to gain access to those loans. All of the other examples that we found um, through the CGAP work that um, John Musser and I have done, uh, uh, all of the other examples said so things like a savings app that rounds up purchases and saves the additional amounts into a, a predetermined date, a schools fees and materials app that spreads out the costs over a year, e-commerce payment by instalment plans. They're all built as fintech offerings that use open APIs that are being made available by payments aggregators and telcos, not by banks. But there are a couple of positive signs in more developed countries. So DBS Singapore, for example, did a great job at the start of COVID-19 to make their payments APIs available to small independent restaurant businesses that to help them to shift to online payments and deliveries models. Um, ABN Amaro did the similar sort of thing. F uh, FinTech are entering the picture here too. One FinTech I admire is Friendly Score. So if you mentioned, if you remember at the beginning, I mentioned um, that a bank couldn't get their head around doing all of the hard work for digitizing their car leasing line of business. Well, the other option that they could do now would be to partner with a fintech like Friendly Score. Uh, Lubna Bazin, the CEO of Friendly Score, told me that they use bank account information APIs with their own machine learning algorithms to calculate a credit rating for customers who have been locked out of traditional bank loans in the past. So using Friendly Score could help underserved small businesses and individuals gain access to cash flows without credit references. At Pl Platformable, we are also looking at whether open banking is changing established patterns of market imbalance or whether the new paradigm is the same as the old paradigm. We did a spot check of 100 fintech that use banking APIs and found that half have women in management roles, but less than 20% have non-white staff in their leadership teams. So there's still a level of structural racism evident in who is getting to enter the new open banking services market. In this age of transformation, I would urge any API provider to be looking at who is using your APIs and seeing whether there are underrepresented groups in terms of who is leading the businesses that consume your APIs. Having a diverse range of business owned consumers of your APIs will build your economic resilience. It makes sense. If you have uniform business teams, they will all be building uniform cookie cutter products. If you have diverse teams, they'll be going after more diverse targeted customer segments. So during COVID or other economic volatility, you have a greater chance that some portion of your end customer base is about to weather the impacts better. And finally, is the API industry winning? 
here's the security page, um, by the way. So security, oh, it says this slide is not completed yet. It's completed now. Um, so the with security, we're seeing about three incidences every quarter. Um, occurring and and against the it's changing each there's not any particular pattern that we're seeing with OWASP um, types of API security classification in this quarter it was mostly broken object level authorization in the previous quarter it was uh, uh, authentication errors um, but in any case uh, security is another important enabler and um, I highly recommend checking out 42 crunch and the work they're doing around um, uh, around security and banking apis in particular and so finally is the API industry winning our uh, data from Q1 showed that um, out of the API landscape of businesses, um, here's the API landscape that Medi and API Days have produced, and we found that 24 of those API service providers have bank uh, and fintech customers. When we sp spoke to API service providers, we found that really what's happening is things like, so a, an API service provider speaks with a bank, is possibly getting the bank on board as a client, um, but they need it to operate behind the firewall. So the service provider goes, make sure their product works behind the firewall, and then they sell it to the bank. But because they've done that, then they're able to sell that product to uh, a wider range of legacy industries and enterprises as well. So there is so we're, there is some signs that um, you know the API industry is maturing because banks have specific requests. You can also see banks like Capital One and Arkea Mutual in France contributing to open source libraries and technologies too. So there's sort of this um, uh, network effect, if you like, of, of feeding back and supporting um, uh, the industry. So I think overall, this sort of data is useful to show where the open banking sector is at. And there are other talks today, like E.L. Sivan from Axway, who will be able to give a more complete picture of the open banking world map. Um, you can also download our quarterly trends reports at platformable.com. So, the importance of data can help us tell better stories about why banks should move to API-enabled approaches and why banks should embrace a platform mindset. I want to talk briefly about that for a minute before I wrap up. Over the little bit less than 10 years I've been involved in APIs, I've seen some of our brightest minds in the sector working or promoting the work of some of what I would call bad actors. We've all probably referenced Amazon, for example, and the Bezos mandate, mandate if you don't build infrastructure with APIs, then you're fired. Well, in actually, actual fact, there are people getting fired, but they are the staff that have highlighted the unsafe working conditions at Amazon during COVID. In the time that it took Bezos to earn an additional $24 million, he took away the measly $2 an hour danger pay from warehouse workers. And those of us who have worked in or around Amazon Web Services, which include me, we've turned a blind eye to what other aspects of the organisation are doing. We did that with Uber when we held them up as an example of the power of APIs and how Uber used them for maps and payments. <clears throat> The Uber apologists for the James Khashoggi murder have a long history of treating women engineers poorly and most recently set up convoluted insurance procedures, systems for Mexican delivery staff so, so that they can, um, can't access paid healthcare if they're involved in serious road accidents. We tell tales of the API successes of Uber, Amazon, Facebook, WeWork and other bad actors without describing the rest of the dog, which is usually currently biting someone else's hand. <clears throat> but in the API sector world, we also have amazing stories of API benefits and best practices. Many we will hear throughout the next two days. These are the stories from Algolia, Twilio, Okta, Amadeus, Visa, Stripe, Cisco and others. And I think it's important to think about what stories we tell to banks. Because which side of the le ledger do we want banks to be on? If you look at the sort of types of platforms run by these businesses I've just mentioned, there becomes a clear difference. The bad actors predominantly have a winner-takes-all mindset. They may have generous provisions for some of their ecosystem partners they need right now, but when they are locked in, they start changing those terms and removing those partnership rights. They also tend to have pretty bad developer experience resources, particularly in the case of Amazon, I hear. But on the other side of the ledger are businesses that have a platform mentality that says your success means our success. 
They are looking for long-term viable partnerships with third parties that provide ongoing incomes for the API provider through regular and ongoing API usage. There are other business models um, besides just um, uh, monetizing your APIs, but they all lead to the fifth why, making money. So when we talk about banks, we want them to see themselves as this second set of platforms, and there's a big danger if they don't. Banks currently do too often have a winner-takes-all mentality as it is, one that we need them to shift in an open banking context in this age of transformation. Because those on the winner-takes-all side of the ledger, uh, they, are, they are after the banks as well. When they say winner-takes-all, they mean taking the banks as well. So the stories we tell, the data we share, we need to encourage banks to see that if they have a wide ecosystem, viable fintech partners, wealthy customers, and the next two billion, then they will be more resilient when the tech giants come for them. So where do we go from here? To quickly sum up, I'm excited about the opportunity that open banking uh, can bring. APIs have enormous impact. Uh, uh, not only on individual businesses, but on our economies and society as a whole. As COVID has shown us, it is now time to work together to build new ecosystems where we can measure the value that has been generated for all stakeholders, so that together we are building more equitable, more participatory, more vibrant and more sustainable societies and economies as we enter the age of transformation. I'm excited to hear the talks today and tomorrow as we dig deeper into the themes and share best practices and emerging ideas. And I encourage you to think through how each think through each presentation and ask yourself, who will benefit from, from this? What sort of dog are we wagging with this tail? Thanks. Thank you very much, Mark. Thanks for uh, the numbers. Thanks for the analysis. Thanks for the call out, the call outs. Uh, thanks for everything. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a good it's a good uh, uh, start. It's a good uh, vision. It's a good warning for the, what the banking, the legacy industry, the healthcare can be, will be, or could be. And uh, yeah, and APIs. I often say that um, when you design APIs, you design the words that's behind it, right? And this is definitely what uh, what we're uh, doing. I and you can already see in the chat some some congratulations. Uh, we're we out of time for the, <laughs> the questions, but uh, I think you delivered uh, uh, the uh, a great opening keynote. And so we go for uh, twenty minutes of of a break. Uh, you can go and so in the expo. Some uh, uh, there are some uh, workshops and some demos happening there for this next twenty minutes. 20 minutes and we will go back. So on, on main stage, this industry stage for a continuing talks about directly the, the banking and, and the financial uh, space and on the stages, on the technical stage for more talks about like API design and API guidelines. Thank you very much, Mark. And again, for everybody, you can find Mark uh, uh, work on his website, platformable.com and all its research. Uh, yeah, we see each other in 20 minutes. Thank you.